now. All right, let's see everyone. Praise God, praise the Lord. It's true, um, we really are going through trials and testing, but it's through his strength and his grace that he's carrying us through it all. Praise the Lord. All right, let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you are on the throne and you're in control of everything, God. We thank you that you are giving us the strength to keep moving forward, even if there's no strength left in us. We thank you that you love each and every one of us in the mess that we're in. Now your love, like Sister Catherine said, is agape and unconditional to us, Lord. No matter what we've done, that you love us and you forgive us. And we thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you open all of our hearts, God, to receive your word. Soften our hearts, Lord. Speak to us through your word. Pray that your name will be glorified and your will be done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today's word. In Galatians 5, verses 22 to 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. In some translations, it also says patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Excuse me. Praise the Lord. So I felt the Lord had me share about all the fruit of the Spirit. And I'm not going to go into each and every one of them right now. I'm just going to talk about one today. Um, but for the next few months, I'm going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And today, I wanted to focus on one of the fruit of the Spirit. And that's long-suffering. Amen? So long-suffering in the Greek, according to Strong's Concordance, is Macrothomia, the usage is patience, forbearance. According to the HELPS word studies, in 3115, macrothemia or macros, um, if you were to break down the word, macros means long and thymos means anger. So it really means waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. This avoids the premature use of force or retribution that rises out of, out of improper anger, a personal reaction. And we are all guilty of this. You know, there is some, some way or another that would trigger us. And, and sometimes we lose our patience, you know, we get impatient and, and it's all of us, all of us are at fault at this. But I just want to talk about repentance. And I want to come before you all and before God and say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for situation yesterday um it was hard i felt like i was being attacked and um and so i was just trying to defend myself and i said things that i didn't mean to say you know i just i confess before you all and before god and i'm sorry i'm so sorry and i repent 
and praise God for his forgiveness, amen? So we do not war against people. This is a spiritual battle. And Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against each other, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are at war against all these works of darkness that we don't even see that could be influencing a person. And then once the attack comes, it, it jumps on, on the other person, right? So there was a situation yesterday where I almost got attacked physically. And I felt like whatever spirit was on that person came upon me. And I wasn't okay after that, you know, after that encounter, I said things I didn't mean to say. And it's a spiritual battle. We are in the spiritual war, amen? So the enemy wants us to lose our peace and retaliate. And I, I fall, fall into this right here. Like yesterday, I just, you know, I couldn't keep my peace anymore. And that's what the enemy wants to do. In John 10, verse 10, it says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. The enemy, the works of darkness, wants to destroy this church, wants to destroy our walk with the Lord, our faith. The enemy wants us to be in strife and in contention and, and just against each other. Because the enemy knows that once we are in one accord, once we are in unison, in one spirit, in God, the enemy fears that because we are powerful in the Lord. We are preaching the word. We are doing worship. We are extending our hands to the poor and all this stuff, whatever God is moving his children to do. It's a threat to the enemy. And with that, we are the number one target. That's why this little church, this little flock is going through so much, going through so much attack, the attacks because the enemy knows what God can do, do through us. Amen. So the enemy tries to stop us from doing what God wants us to do. You know, we would come coming up here before you all, like, I'm like, oh Lord, I don't know. I'm a mess. I don't know if I can even speak. But that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to stop this from happening. But praise God that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Second Chronicles 20, verse 15 says, For the battle is not yours, but God's. You know, I confess, I was trying to fight my own battle yesterday, but I just... We had to come to the realization that whatever we're facing, whatever trial or anything, the battle is the Lord's. We don't need to fight, so we don't need to try to defend ourselves. We just have to give it to him, amen? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, thank you, Lord, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ even in the mess that we are in, Jesus has the victory and Jesus will fight this battle for us, amen? So thanks be to God that he, that our Father in heaven, the God who created the heavens and the earth and all of creation, thanks be to God that he is patient and long-suffering towards us towards each and every one of us. We've all done things against the Lord. We've all fallen short, but his grace is sufficient for us. His grace is still there. He's saying, I know you did this, but I love you. I love you anyway, and I'm going to fix you. I'm going to change you. And that's God's work, amen? Thank you, Lord. So, According to allthemore.org, 
least on the website, it said, you know, one minute we're thankful. And then the next minute we're complaining. Am I right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> this is really our walk. One minute we're kind to others. The next minute we hurry past someone in need. One minute we surrender all to God. The next minute we're seeking control over our lives. And this is really very much the walk because we can be fine on one second and then all of a sudden something happens and we're not okay, you know. Um, but it's like through every season, through however we feel, God remains the same. God is still good. Can I get an amen? God is still good. God is still righteous. God is still just. No matter how much of a mess and broken and not right we are, he is still good. Amen? So the question is, why is God so patient with us? Even though there's so many times where we turn our back from him, where we don't even come to him and God wants us to come to him, but we focus on other things or we do the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, why is he so patient with us? So for those of us in the Lord, God doesn't show us patience based on our behavior. Patience is who he is. He said so himself in Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, gracious and merciful, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is who God is. God is merciful. God is just and, and long-suffering towards us. By offering us his patience, he offers us himself. Praise the Lord. We don't deserve patience, and we sure can't earn it. God freely gives it, gives it to us. He freely gives us patience because he will never cease to be who he is. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So let's look at Old Testament examples. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture... Every verse in the Bible is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. He corrects us with his word. He convicts us with his word in our hearts for instruction and in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that includes the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament to show us, amen? So now let's look at some examples in the Bible. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 9 says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So there's a man of God in the Bible. His name is Elijah. And there's a person named Jezebel who was trying to kill all the prophets. And she was coming after Elijah. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Once he knew that Jezebel was going to come and attack, like he was scared, you know, he wanted to run, and he actually did. 
But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And Elijah, he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Because of the persecution that he was facing, because his life was being hunted down, he couldn't take it anymore. He said, Lord, I can't stand this. I want to leave. I want to die. I want to die. And I don't know about you, but, you know, we've all gone through struggles. And I've actually come across this in my life, like where I said, Lord, you know, life is so hard. Life is so tough. And I don't want to live anymore. I just want to die. And I want to be with you, Lord, in a place where there's no more sorrow, no more suffering, and no more pain. But because I'm asking for it, he has me here. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'm asking God to take me, but he's saying, no, your time here is not yet done. And I have an assignment for you. So this is how Elijah was feeling. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat, arise and eat. So even if he felt like dying, he had an encounter with the Lord. God met him there in that broken place. And the angel said to him, arise. It's like he's saying, get up, get up. It's time to walk with me. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. He was being provided for. He was given food and water. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. Or in other words, this walk will be difficult, but arise and eat, eat of the bread of God, eat of the word of God that will strengthen you. It's the word of God that keeps us going, keeps us going in the difficulties of life. Amen. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. So he was basically fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. As far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. It's as if we're saying, Lord, I have served you. I have given everything up for you. But Elijah responded, but the people of Israel have broken their covenants with you, torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. You know, Elijah was just like feeling so alone, so alone, and he knew that the enemy was coming after him. And this is a spiritual thing. Like, how does this speak to us today? I mean, this is a story, but there's a spiritual aspect here. Because the works of darkness, the enemy can be targeting us. The enemy wants to stop us from doing what God wants us to do. He wants to stop from furthering God's kingdom and sharing his love and light. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face on his cloak. Oh, there was a fire, there was the earthquake, so much going on, but he heard the voice of the Lord through the gentle wind. So when he heard that voice, 
even in his gentle calling, you know, I can't imagine Elijah's like, oh my gosh, is that God? It's like he has his cloak over his face, like just covering himself. I can't imagine like with a blanket over yourself, you know, if God is calling you, how would you feel if you were to hear the audible voice of God? How would you respond? And God was calling Elijah here. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you hiding behind this cave? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenants with you, torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came. Go back the same way you came. In 1 Kings 19, 18 says, you know, Elijah was feeling so alone. He said, I, I'm, I'm the only one left and they're coming after me. And God responded here, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal. God has reserved a remnant. God has reserved this church. He has reserved us. And we are not alone. We have one another. We have our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. God in his loving, in his patience, God in his patience, you know, even after Elijah was so fearful and afraid and was trying to protect himself and wanted to die and felt like he was alone, but he wasn't alone. In the, in the mess that Elijah was in, God in his patience was reassuring Elijah and in his loving kindness called him back. Amen. And he is the same way with each and every one of us too. Praise the Lord. And so we all are given a choice. We all have the free will to choose whether we choose to serve the Lord no matter how we feel no matter what comes at us, or we choose to refuse and not serve the Lord. And that's a scary thing to do. And Nehemiah 9.17 says, They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them. But they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. And this is the children of Israel when he set them free from being slaves in Egypt. And even after God performed miracle after miracle, they still rebelled. They still hardened their necks and their heart. And they chose someone else to lead them, to lead them back into Egypt, to back into bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Just like how God was with the Israelites, that's how God is with us today. He never leaves us nor forsakes us, no matter how broken we are, no matter how much we try to run from God, he's still there for us. Nehemiah 9, 30 to 31. Yet for many years you had patience with them, and yet they would not listen. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, even if they didn't listen, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for you are God, gracious and merciful. Amen. And so when we see our loved ones going the wrong way, heading the wrong direction, any pe person that we're concerned about and, you know, maybe they're not, not making the right choice. They're being stubborn and they don't want to come to God. They don't want to be healed by God. In the midst of that, God is calling them. God has not forsaken them. 
even if they're not yet coming to him. God is still there. God is still pursuing them. God is still calling them in. Amen. In Joel 2, verses 12 to 13. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. You know, back in the days when they were fasting and crying out to God, the people would just tear their clothes and in remorse and in sadness and in brokenness. But he's saying here, do that to your heart, not outwardly, because he, he's looking at the heart. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Praise God that he is slow to anger towards us. Amen. So in Matthew 23, 37 says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and this is Jesus speaking, and it's as if he's saying, Oh, my people, my people, my people on earth, I see your struggles. I see your hardships. I know you're carrying these burdens. It's like he's calling each and every one of us, everyone. Oh, my people, how often I wanted to gather your children together. I wanted to gather you together to me as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing you were not willing. This is the heart of God. This is the heart of God. He wants us. He wants his people to come to him. But there are those who just choose not to. And he's given them the free will. He's like, okay, go ahead. Go live your life. But I am here for you. God is saying, I am here for you. And when you come to that point of brokenness and you, you're crying out, I'm here to catch you when you fall. Amen. So in John 3, 20 to 21 says, For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, comes to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, that his deeds may be clearly seen. Everything, everything may be clearly seen, the good and the bad, for everyone to see that they have been done in God. And it's to show that there's no righteousness in us. There's no goodness in us. He is the only good one. Amen. We are all a work in progress. Can I get an amen? <laughs> we are all a work in progress. We're not there yet. I know I'm not there yet. Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned, each and every one of us. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We should not judge one another because we have our own shortcomings too. We shouldn't say, oh, this person did this, this person did that. But God is asking you all today, have you yourselves done something too? Have you yourselves did things too that was not right? So just with his love and grace and forgiveness that he extends to us, because we've done that to him, who are we? Who are we not to extend that grace and forgiveness to those around us as well, amen? In Romans 9, 14 and 18 says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Now I'll have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God, of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Even the hand of Pharaoh, when Pharaoh was putting the Israelites, all the Israelites into bondage, into slavery, 
God's hand was on the heart of Pharaoh. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. He holds the hearts of man, of each and every one of us. So he's the one to soften or harden a heart. Amen? In Romans 9, 22 to 24, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, God wants to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. You know, by the snap of a finger, he can just have his way. He can just say, okay, all those people that are just not doing good on earth, that are just going the wrong way, just at the snap of his finger, he can just end their life. And yet he doesn't. He still gives them a chance. He still gives them chance after chance to repent and to turn to God. And so God is long suffering in the midst of persecution. In Jeremiah 15, 15. Oh Lord, you know, you know what is going on. You know my heart. You know what each and every one of us are going through. Remember me and visit me. It's as if it's saying, Lord, you know what's happening. Come, come now. I need you, Lord. I need you to just speak to me or do something and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, in your patience, O Lord, do not take me away. Know that for your sake, I have suffered rebuke. You know, God chastens those, he, he corrects those whom he loves. Just as a father or mother loves a child, he would correct them. They would correct them. And that's how our heavenly father is with us too. He would tell us what is okay and not okay. But it's through his correction, it's through his chastening that his love for us is shown. His love for us is there through it all. It says, I have suffered your rebuke, Lord. I know you're chastening me. You're correcting me. You're, you're changing me. So in your patience, Lord, do not take me away. And Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, not only that, in the midst of all this, in the midst of all the hardships and struggle, we should rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 2 Timothy 3.10-15 Timothy 3, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, and that's God's word. The manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance through all of the hardships, all the persecutions and afflictions, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen? Praise God for delivering us. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus, will suffer persecution. It's guaranteed in, the, in his word. When we choose to follow God, when we choose to desire to, to live for him, it's guaranteed that we're going to be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being de deceived. They themselves are being deceived by the enemy. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing that whom you have learned them, and that from childhood or, or spiritual youth, you have known the Holy script, Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. James 5, 7 says, Dear brothers and sisters, 
all of you, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rain in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the viable harvest to ripen. And just like right now, this beautiful green grass and, and any gardeners out there, I know we have a few gardeners here. It's like a gardener or farmer just knowing the seasons, knowing when it's time for a fruit or, or flower to bloom and knowing when it's time for God to just spiritually just work in us too. There's a time for us to be fruitful and there's a time where God is dealing with us. James 5, 10 to 11, for examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, we give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. So Job in the Bible, he suffered so much. He lost his family. He lost his possessions. He lost everything. And even Job got sick. He had boils all over his body. And God allowed this to happen because Satan was roaming around the earth. And Satan told God, he said, this person, Job, he worships you because you put a hedge of protection around him. But once you lift that hedge of protection off of him, he will curse you to your face. And then God said, okay, go ahead, test Job, but do not lay a hand on his body. Do not lay a hand on his finger. Don't, don't kill him. He allowed God, God allowed him to test him. And so with that, God was dealing with Job. He lost everything and praise God that in the end, it says here in the story, you know, if, if you don't know that story, I encourage you to read that in the Bible. It's the book of Job. It says you can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end because through all that Job persevered in the Lord and not once did Job curse God to his face. Not once did he got mad at God, that God took everything away from him. He was still praising God to the end and Satan had to flee. So the Lord was kind to him at the end and for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. And because of that, Job was doubly blessed. He was doubly blessed in the end. I mean, sure, he had his family, he had his everything in the beginning, but when he gone through that suffering and that trial, he passed the test and God blessed him double fold. Amen. So it is in God's nature. It is in God's nature to have patience towards his people and forgive all sin. That's just who he is. But the enemy is the complete opposite and wants to condemn. The enemy is the complete opposite of this. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those, to those who are in Christ Jesus. The accuser has been cast down. Revelation 12, 10 to 12 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Woe to those who are on this earth right now. The devil knows he has a short time and he's doing everything he can to keep us from following God. Amen. 
But praise God that he does not will for anyone to perish. Second Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And repentance is turning turning around to God and saying, Lord, I just turn from my ways. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like this, seeing this in me. I need you to change me, Lord. Only you can change me. Only you can change me. Ultimately, this leads us to the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation of the fruit of his spirit. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5 says, now the, may the Lord direct your hearts, direct your hearts into the love of God, into the patience of Christ. We need our Lord's help to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. We need God's help to extend love and grace and patience because on our own, on our own, we fall to our flesh. We get angry, we get upset, and we need the power of God. We need his self-control. We need him to change us, amen? Matthew 19, 26 says, But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible. It's like we can go before God and say, Lord, I see this in me. I don't know how to change myself. I don't know how to stop this. I need you to change me, Lord. And Jesus says, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. In conclusion, Numbers 14, 18 says, the Lord is long suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Oceans 1, 9 to 14. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray. It's through prayer that we can go through this. Amen. To pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, strengthened in him according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, praise the Lord, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And just like God, our Heavenly Father forgives us, he wants us to forgive others as well. It's a scary thing to fall into the hands of the Lord. And in his word, he commands us to forgive. Because in the same manner, we forgive one another. If we do not forgive, our Heavenly Father will not forgive us as well. So this forgiveness is a serious thing. He wants us to check our hearts no matter what has been done. No matter what has been done. He wants us to forgive. Amen. Romans 15, 5 to 6. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. That you may be with one mind and one mouth. And this is what the enemy is scared of when we are in one accord in, in Christ. You know, he, that's what he does everything he can to just cause arguments and fights and contentions and divisions. When we are in one in the Lord, 
the enemy is afraid. That we all, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you, God. We thank you for your patience and long suffering towards us, even when we don't deserve it. We thank you for your love for each and every one of us, that we are not forced to follow you. You've given each and every one of us free will. We all have a choice, but it's, it's in that love that you've given us that choice, Lord. So, Father in heaven, we pray and we ask that you help us. Help us turn to you. Help us just come before you. Soften, soften all of our hearts, Lord. Break down the walls in our hearts. Help us forgive one another and love one another. Whether we feel loved or not, whether we feel loved back, help us extend your grace and love and mercy and patience. So we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for knocking at the door of our hearts. We thank you for speaking to us. So Lord, we pray that you continue Continue to do your work in us, God. Continue to change us. We need you to change us. We need you to soften our hearts and change our hearts. Help us love one another. We know that God is love. In your patience and long-suffering, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, peace in your hearts. Amen. God bless you all. Praise the Lord.